in the interest of time, I'll go straight through to you, Kathy. Obviously, the University of Cape Town occupies a, a really powerful position, a very public position within South Africa. What, what's your sense of your responsibilities to um, your, your neighborhood? I mean, for, for us at UCT, social responsiveness has always been a central part of our mission because we believe that uh, knowledge and research need to result in ways to serve and, and help change our society for the better. And, and I, think, I think it is precisely this that has helped UCT to establish itself as an African institution with a world-class reputation. And I think that's what uh, Merrick and other colleagues have been saying. We are located in Africa to serve Africans and to equip Africans to serve the world with African innovation. That's, that's our belief. We, we don't see ourselves uh, as serving the world, the, you know, as being for the world. We are for Africa, even as we are a global institution. And our physical location is very important in that mission. We, we are located on the world's youngest continent, as almost 60% of the population is under the age of 25. We are near the cradle of humankind, where archaeologists are uncovering our prehistoric origins as a species. We are on the coast where three important oceans, the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Southern Ocean, meet. And as a result, we are directly involved in groundbreaking research on Antarctica and the Agalas current that help explain the ocean's effects on the global climate. We are, we are also in, part, in, a, in the part of the world that was selected for the square kilometer array. And I mean, that selection, if you think about it, you can say we selected for the square kilometer array for radio telescopes because actually we are a dark continent. And, 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 and perhaps so, what some might regard as a disadvantage became an advantage for us in terms of winning and beating all the other uh, countries in, in um, uh, being selected for the SKA, uh, which means UCT has access to new data that help to explain the origins of the universe. And that winning the SKA, I mean, the, the world, the scientific community hasn't started calculating how many scientists moved into South Africa simply because of that, and how many top scientists move into South Africa and Cape Town simply because of our location in the sense of the three oceans. Most important, we are on a, on a continent whose population has been largely overlooked by the world as a source of innovation and a contributor to potential solutions to the many problems that the world is dealing with today. I mean, the world woke up not long ago that in fact, the whole world is multilingual. And we've been doing this work for years. And, and so we can be leading in these kinds of areas. Our campus sits on the slopes of Table Mountain. And so we, we, we are perceived sometimes, of course, and this is the downside of where we are. We are perceived by, by, by some in our community as that institution up on a hill. And, and when I became vice chancellor, I mean, I, perhaps I should even say those who perceive us perceive us as that institution high, high up on a hill that takes or accepts only the highly gifted students. It was a burden for me because that discourse it was a discourse of people who look like me and have my experience. And so when I became vice chancellor, I wanted to make it clear that UCT belongs to all South Africans, not just the students who had the academic marks to study here uh, and not just academics, who teach and do research here. So we have offices and facilities in the informal communities of Cape Town, in the Cape Flats, where poverty lives along privilege. Um, and we do work among TB patients in the communities where they live. We take mobile medical clinics into the community. So once a week, our students are taken by a bus into the communities, our medical students, to do work there. We have a solution space right in one of the most impoverished uh, areas in Cape Town to work with, with entrepreneurs to build businesses right there, uh, emerging from the community as part of doing that. But it's interesting that you can do so much for the community and still be seen as an ivory tower against the community. And, and working that off took me going into communities, un, 
unusual places in the community, spending time uh, with people on the ground in the communities, in churches. And it's amazing what happens when you get there because you get people who are security guards, cleaners, the ones who think their children never can come here and the university doesn't belong to them. And you sit with them in church where they are the deacons and you tell them that the university is, is, is theirs and they need to take care of it what it does to the university. And what it did, it contributed to coming down the context of protest because part of the, what drove the protest was the alienation of people in the university, the minority who came from communities who felt that it is not for them and it's marginalizing them. And of course the university, also our middle campus is built on a site that's um, a grave site of slaves and in fact was an occupation for the first peoples of Cape Town. And so you can imagine the people who feel that here's this place that came is occupying and is not accepting our children because they say they are not good enough. You can do all sorts of programs, but one of the things that the community wants to see is, is the university in the community? And to bring the university in the community, I went into the community to say to them, the university is, is, is yours and they see me as the university and whoever I come with and whatever we do there is not just there for charity. It is there because it belongs to them. And so they have to take care of the university. So parents of the leading, the students who are leading protests, I could talk to them at church and I could tell them, well, you got to help us stop this. And, and that contributed to bringing a, a context of calm. And that also allows us to proceed with the academic project. And that's the power of having the, the university in the community and the community in the university. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kathy. Obviously, we've had all the, uh, the imagery there of the, the, the campus on the hill, the ivory towers, obviously the dreaming spires of, of Oxford, and, and, and of course, referencing the need to open the gates. Um, perhaps I could stick with you, Kathy, to, to push a bit more on your responsibility for inclusion. Um, you know, you're under huge public scrutiny. Um, you know, as a historically white institution, your your responsibility to be more inclusive to Black South Africans. All the institutions you represent are under huge scrutiny around the inclusion side. What more can be done? What are the sort of initiatives that you can take or are taking that really do open doors to opportunity to people from you know more deprived backgrounds who have the talent? How are you identifying the talent? How do you uh, compensate for the prior educational challenges they may have faced. Um, what's your responsibility to open those gates more widely? Kathy, come back, come back on some initiatives that you're taking and I'll ask the wider group as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, the, 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 there are a lot, a lot of initiatives. Of course, there's lots of pressure to do more. And um, uh, the initiatives, you know, we've got lots of initiatives where we work with schools, We've got our school development unit, uh, uh, you know, that work with schools around the Cape Flats. Um, but we also have programs that work with students that we admit into the university, because it is clear that once students come here, that it is not just academic achievement that makes them succeed. And, and it's precisely that, that um, a, a part of, and, and, and the learnings that come from the protest, recent project protest of 2015 to 2018 have, have taught us much and have pushed me to, to, to actually interrogating the, to, or, or beginning to question our assumptions about underrepresented groups in higher education, particularly in at UCT and particularly in STEM subjects. It, oftentimes we assume that these groups are underrepresented because students from those communities are underprepared due to poor schooling, lack of resources such as library books and, or laboratories and so on. And sometimes that's the reason. And, 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 and I wonder though, whether if, if, if there's, there are no other reasons, um, whether if it's not possible that the university itself is underprepared for working with working class students. Um, my, my analysis, in being this at UCT, where, by the way, even though we reworked our, our admissions requirements in 2014, uh, my predecessor led this project, and um, we we made sure that we we, we work um, deliberately 
uh, to admit students from uh, uh, black communities, they still had to meet the requirements academically. All right. So they meet the requirements academically, but because we have an oversupply of students who qualify to come here, we've got to we've got to select, right? So we 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 we've had to do that, but after so many years, uh, three years of being here, I've started asking colleagues, um, perhaps we are better prepared to admit and teach um, middle class students. Perhaps, or maybe say, perhaps we are better prepared to teach, to, to, to teach and ensure success of middle class students. Note, let me pause a little bit and make you aware that this year, uh, in our group of first years, uh, for the first time, we've got 41.5% of our students, first year students coming from families where they are the first to go to university. And this is a major breakthrough uh, after many years of being seen as a university for white people and, and the black middle class. So the, even though the, 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 the students that we get, the few students that we've been getting uh, 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 who come from poor backgrounds have been here, but they, they do not succeed. So you've got the middle class that's succeeding. And so this under preparedness of our students, I've, I've had to ask questions about it. And then I said, maybe we are un un under prepared as a university. The under preparedness of many of our students, ex that many of our students experience has to do in my view with um, their lack of cultural capital and not so much their intellect. It has to do sometimes with the traumatic home environments that so many of them come from uh, as a result of poverty, the effect of HIV and AIDS on their families and communities, perhaps unemployment in their homes and, and restrictions placed on their parents and grandparents by apartheid. So some of them come here with that baggage. They've, they've got all these um, uh, results of metric, but but they have other baggage that they come, they come with. And many of them might come into university with the results, but they haven't necessarily learned how to be independent and learn to learn. So across university, success tends to be either racialized or confined to a particular socioeconomic class. I don't think this is only a South African phenomenon. I think it is there elsewhere in the world. And to me, that indicates a built-in middle-class prejudice on the part of the institution, an expectation that students will transform by assimilating into black or white or, or female version of a middle-class or Western thinking or male graduates that have dominated graduation ceremonies. And so in our thinking about uh, how do we widen uh, access to our university, we're thinking beyond just making our university accessible to the previously um, uh, marginalized. We, we are more concerned about once they come in, how much do they feel that this is their place? How much does the space transform as a result of being here? And how long does it take for them to succeed? Is this a place for them to succeed? Because if we do not do that, the agitation will not stop. That doesn't mean you pass students whether they deserve, or deserve it or not. It means we critique um, uh, who teaches, how we teach, and, 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 and why is it that it's only the middle class who, who seem to succeed in our hands. And I think that that problem is a, is a, is a problem that all around the world um, uh, we've got to grapple with. We certainly um, uh, is uh, top of mind and it's part of what what um, uh, some some students and staff have called have included in the in their calls for the decolonization of of, of universities, um, and that even that call is a call um, uh, uh, that's it's not a straightforward um, uh, a call. It's it's a it's a call a call that needs to be debated because there isn't just one script to what decolonization means. But for us, it means the university and its ways of, of being and doing has to be open to um, a diverse group of people, including black people and the working class.